I just like to connect a couple of dots for everyone here. Um, I'm Beth Griffin. Um, I'm from the Southwest Michigan side of the state. And, and Amanda, you said that 13% of Muslims go to mosque, and you know you were questioning the number, which I agree with you on that. Um, and then Mr. Thompson said uh, something about care and how care likes to complain and use our constitution against us. Well, you guys need to know something. U United States wide, CARE has less than 4,000 members. Do you know how many members, for example, just the Southwest Michigan Tea Party has? <laughs> 1,200 last night. I, I, but, but you need to put it into perspective. CARE makes a lot of noise, and they, they want to shut us up, and they want to make us be good Americans and not diss anyone else's religion, and not make waves and try to be nice and go by the golden rule, but this is not their game plan. They will do anything to advance their agenda, and that is not to preserve the U.S. Constitution. So I suggest that the next time you hear Fox News quoting CARE, you remember that? Yeah. Because there are still a lot of good people that still don't understand why CARE gets a lot of flack, and it's because they deserve it. <laughs> um, one uh, one informational point. Um, I would guess that Dick Thompson and uh, Bill Wagoner uh, are aware of Frank Gaffney. Frank Gaffney has just created a, a ten-part DVD series or uh, online series that uh, is is very informational about. Um, all that we've been talking about here in the, in the, the national perspective regarding the uh, Muslim bro Brotherhood. And you, you can visit that. It's just two weeks old. And I think one of the greatest struggles that we face is informing people at the local level, right? They have so little understanding. And this is about the best informational, broad-based piece that, that I have seen. And you can find that. I believe it's MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com. MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com, and if that's not quite right, look up Frank Gaffney, and you'll find it. He was in the in the uh, in the Reagan administration, and he's been involved in the security issues concern for 30 years. One of the great experts <coughs> of our of our nation. Thanks. This is just a personal comment, and nothing to base it on. But I have wondered about corruption. <coughs> And I wonder if there's money, favors, crossing hands, some way, in terms of how um, insidiousness of this creeping Sharia getting into our country. And uh, I can't prove anything, but I, I wonder if anybody else has thought the same thing. No. No. This may be off the ALAC topic, which is so important, but. But it's, it, I think it's tied in. Um, a lot of us in this room, while passionate about passing ALEC, are also passionate about what's happening in our schools. Because this is where it's going to change for all of us. And when they take the hearts and the minds of our children in our public schools, and it's insidious. Any of you who are from <coughs> IB International Baccalaureate programs in your schools need to know, need to know that uh, Mr. Thompson, you talked about the UN, that we need to get rid of the UN. This program is tied to the UN. Everything that they believe, know that in the in the diploma program, one of the tracks is on Islam. They don't teach American government. They don't teach US history. The IB programs, they don't teach World War I, World War II, the American Constitution, but they're on an entire track on the rise of Islam from 672 to whatever. They teach the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict from 1948 <coughs> until 1970-something and leave out all the history of where that came from. So as much as we need to be involved with, with ALAC, and it's imperative that we pass this, we need to know because what's happening to our children in schools. We talked about universities. If we don't stop this, it won't matter because they're our future generation who is going to be making the decisions for us. Yeah. You know, as my kids said, I'm going to choose your nursing home. 
<laughs> you know what? It's not a joke. They're going to be choosing what laws we Let me on. add something about the UN there, because uh, the, the council control of my <laughs> states in the UN is very, very effective in the UN. Uh, and, and, and you know, on, on the on the sad state of affairs, I, I last a couple days ago I was um, meeting with a former uh, delegate to the UN from a sovereign nation, and she was a Christian and had no idea what was going on up there. When she got there, she had the courage, like we've seen here, to stand up to it. Oh, well, let me tell you the story uh, that she told. And this is a distinguished uh, member of her country. She was a speaker of the house uh, of her nation. She would held a, uh, a minister's uh, position, like a secretary of state type of position, high level position, before she was the de a delegate at the UN. When she started speaking out on these matters, uh, she was addressed not within the UN, but outside the UN, uh, not by another diplomat, but, but they had sent uh, staff people to her and telling her that she needs to stop uh, stating these positions or that uh, her country would no longer see another dollar. And that is the game they play. Um, it, it is, especially in these developing nations, you want the UN money, you got to play our role. Uh, there's no transparency, you know, they, they pretend to be a democracy up there, they're not. If you don't think the way they do, they move you out like they moved her out. And back to the topic of what we're talking about today. Um, I, on the one hand, many of the issues you guys care about, we all care about as far as on the issues of life and family issues, Here's the sad state of affairs. The folks that are carrying the water on those issues for us in the UN, it's not the Christians. It's actually those Islamic countries. Now, they very, they very quickly go a different way when it talks about polygamy and things like that, and, and they very quickly go a very different way, uh, and, and this is something to be concerned about uh, when they're organizing to uh, have countries enact in their laws, as soon as, as, soon as a UN treaty or something is passed, they're telling countries to put in their constitution, well that's automatically the law of your country. And, and some of these laws uh, include things like, they now call it religious defamation, uh, or it used to be Islamic defamation, and the whole idea behind that is, well, now if you say something, if you even hold a debate like we're talking about today, now you'd be subject to a civil lawsuit with damages. And, and you know, we stopped that one, but if we didn't stop it, this would not have taken place today because everyone up at this panel would have been the subject and would have been a defendant in a civil lawsuit, you know, attempting to take, you know, every dollar that we own. And so you need to understand how, what this money is buying and at what level and, and what they're doing with it and how they're trying to, the, the UN is very, very important because they are, they're using that UN to get this stuff implemented in other nations and, and, and as, uh, Mr. Thompson said, you know, this is the job. Uh, yeah. yeah. uh, I want to add uh, to what Wagner said. My own personal experience at the United Nations when I was the U.S. delegate at the uh, UN uh, CSW, uh, that was um, uh, the Western women in the Western countries where there is democracy and freedom do not need a CSW, it means uh, Committee on the Status of Women, uh, because uh, we are already under the freedom, democracy, laws, equal laws. The people who need support from organizations like CSW are the women who don't have it. But these countries, the women in, uh, like for example, I use Iran, um, I learned that um, uh, organization, auxiliary organizations of the US, like UNICEF and UNIFEM, which is supposed to be working uh, to support the women uh, around the world, they receive millions of dollars from these governments from Iranian government, from Saudi Arabia, from every one of these misogynist uh, dictators, Islamic dictators, to say nothing. And when I challenged the, the, the lady in charge of UNIFEM, she told me, what well, we need funding. I said, what? Well, funding for what? If you don't defend the rights of the women who need to be defended, what do you need funding for? 
Yeah. Well, there are poor women in Africa. Oh. Oh. This was what she told me. The money which I uh, talked about it on, in my speech at the, at the G8 uh, summit, that sacrificing Iranian women or Saudi women, women who live under the Islamic tyrannies, to get money from the, uh, the dictators to give to the African women. What kind of sense does that make? And on the other side is that, uh, I don't know if any one of you knows or not, do you know who's a member, what country is now a member of the Commission on the Status of Women United Nations? Iran. No. <laughs> In order for us to be uh, representatives, uh, representatives of this point of view, I would like to request a couple of things. One is um, the establishment law versus the... Versus the free exercise class. Free exercise. Mm -hmm. Can you give us something? Yes, if you go to the Family Research Council, I wrote a white paper on that very issue, and, and, and if you type in the Family Research Council's website, uh, Professor Wagner, Sharia law, and the American Constitution, it should pop right up. Okay, so that'll give us the video at the beginning was really good. It laid out six objections, six points. Would like to see that in a PowerPoint or a Word document so that that is something that we can have in our personal notes. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube? No, I don't, I don't want it in a video. I want it on paper. Paper presentation point counterpoint point. I think it's only in the video. And for those of you who want to get that video, it is on YouTube or contact the person who invited you to this. We all have copies of it. We can send you the link. Maybe somebody should get that written for you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for allowing me to just ask a few questions. Three questions I will ask. First, I would like to give some comments. Although I'm too small a fry to be commenting on such uh, eminent scholars, and uh, Professor Vaila had the honor of reading your article, Islam, Sharia, and the U.S. Constitution. I would strongly recommend if you all can find it, please read that article. If you want to be wise, that is an article which you must read. And one thing, I just, uh, excuse me for saying it, I'll become a citizen probably after the 5th of June. Till then, I will say, you Americans. After that, I'll start saying, we Americans. You Americans. Know nothing of Sharia. You know nothing of Islam. The little that you know is wrong. Whatever they teach you, you take it very quietly. And Mr. Ajima, sir, you should feel very proud that people call you Islamophobic. Anybody who calls you Islamophobic, anybody over here, take care of it. don't have your heads in the sand, I was about to say something else, which is <laughs> And uh, soldiers are not given to use of parliamentary language. So I will not use that, but I'm sure you understand. Because being Islamophobic means you understand everything, your eyes are open, your ears are open, and your brain is open. Yeah. Not like other people. You yeah. should feel very proud of it. Tell me your background. Right. Sir, I'm from Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen. I migrated here in 2005. I served in the Pakistan Army as retired as a lieutenant colonel. We are seven brothers and sisters. All of us have left and <coughs> come here. Why have we come here? We have come here just for two reasons, liberty and freedom. Unfortunately, you Americans do not know the value of these two. I told my wife that I'll be going for this. She said, keep your mouth shut. When <laughs> <laughs> wishes, they know that when I open my mouth, I start shooting it. <laughs> I can't drink it. Because I have two children over there. And uh, anyway, the question which I was going to ask you, <laughs> when is United States going to be, you know, stop being politically correct? <laughs> Do you want this country to be the land of the brave and home of the free? And third is, 
especially sir, you're a lawyer, you're also a lawyer. Can you sheath two swords in one scabbard? This is an idiom in our part of the world that can you sheath two swords in one scabbard? One is a straight sword, which is a Western sword, American sword, and the other is a scimitar, like you and I know, madam, the curved sword. Can you sheath these two in one scabbard no. without damaging the scabbard or either of the swords? If you can do it, if you think you can do it, please let Sharia law come in. <laughs> and as far as women's rights is concerned, Ladies, you do not know, have you seen a woman being whipped in public? I have seen what it is. If I start telling you half the thing, what that uh, condition is, you will start puking. Let me tell you, it is not a very good sight. Have you seen people being stoned to death? I have seen it. The only purely Sharia country in the world after Saudi Arabia during uh, the Prophet's time was Afghanistan under the Taliban. It is not a very pleasant sight to see people being stoned to death. Let me tell you, even this gentleman who's a soldier, you start puking. I have seen these things, I have to go there for some reason. Fight this Sharia as much as you can. Fight it to the hill. There is a saying that you see today, United States is the most prosperous country in the world, there is no doubt. How has this prosperity come? There is an Athenian, uh, was an Athenian uh, scholar, he said, taking the example of Leonidas and the 300 Spartans, take these men as your example. Like them, remember that prosperity is only for the free. And freedom is the sole possession of those who have the courage to defend it. You want to be prosperous? The United States was prosperous because it was free and the US soldier had the courage to defend that freedom. In 1860, in uh, 1914 and 1940. Uh, 40. If you want this, defend the freedom. If you want it to continue being progress, to be prosperous. And those three questions, please think over it and give the answers. And for God's sake, do not let Sharia come in in any form. If you want to be free. Uh, this is in regards to, we're in a conference here, we talk about what the judges do and don't do. Do you have a conference Thank with the know. judges and explaining to them what they should do or don't do? That's a good well, question. I think, you know, we should get together, you know, <laughs> and do that. Um, yeah. judges, Does that ever happen? Well, nationally, and I was a U.S. magistrate judge that covered kind of most of the top part of Florida to come down and um, Toward, down toward Tampa. Once a year, though, we'd all get together and there'd be a judicial conference and we'd have all sorts of speakers and, and, and things. But I can tell you that nothing like this, you know, was ever addressed. And if it would be, I'm guessing it would be from a very different perspective than perhaps you've heard uh, today. Now, that being said, um, maybe it's something that we ought to do. Uh, yeah. That's, that's yeah. something. Yeah. That, Out, not without my daughter, so that was uh, something that a gentleman wanted to address if anybody saw that movie. I'd like to go back to the previous question just a minute ago because he gave us three questions. One of us, why are we doing anything? And the answer to that question, uh, there's a book out called Why Do We Whisper? And I haven't read the book, but I love the title. Uh, so the reason I, I think to answer uh, the question is because there's a cost to be paid. Mm -hmm. And right. you look at our our forebears from once we've come, and they paid the ultimate cost with regard to their lives and their prosperity and their homes. And we are now, I think, in a very close to a, a similar situation. I, I have not seen an America divided 
Uh, in fact, I think we are now more divided on many issues than we were just before the Civil War. Uh, and so we are now at a time in America where each one of us has to look at uh, not our bank book or our mortgage or our house or all the possessions that we've been blessed with, but we need to look at our children and our grandchildren. And we have to ask, are we willing to pledge our lives and our treasure for the future of something that, that really does matter? Yeah. Um, and the answer to that question is, um, because it costs. And so my challenge to you today, are you willing to pay the cost? Yeah, um, I'm trying to kind of understand what we're up against. Now, the way I see it is K through 12, we don't teach the Constitution. Then when they go to college or wherever after that, we don't teach the Constitution. Then when they go to law school, I'm not a law school graduate, I'm a medical school graduate, so I didn't learn the Constitution in medical school. But I understand they only teach precedent, they don't teach the Constitution. So now you have these people coming out and becoming judges, they don't know anything about the Constitution, I guess. That's what I understand. So then I hear about precedent. And um, so it doesn't really matter what the Constitution says because precedent is really what's important. Actually, precedent so, doesn't matter anymore. You just go look and find an international case if you can't find the one you want here in the US. <laughs> OK, so, so what I'm thinking is the whole idea of this Sharia stuff is to get just a few things, be persistent, and then get some things in, and they become precedent. I mean, is this, is this kind of what they're trying to do? I just am trying to understand what we're up against. Does that make any sense, my question? And oh, by the way, I have a West Point grad, 2011. Yeah. 